I'm, I'm based out of, near Carmarthen, which is about two hours from here. But we work across the UK from our base there. Um, I'm going to talk at the end about Caringwood, which was obviously winner of House of the Year last year. I've been on the judging panel this year, which has been great fun to be nosy going around other people's houses and also to understand the judging process, which makes the winner win even more sweet, actually, when you realise how complicated it is to really be judging apples and bananas at the same time. Everybody's projects in different contexts, different scales, different budgets, different needs. Um, but what I'm going to start talking about is the vernacular and the context in which we live and work. Uh, as Matt said, I moved from London a little longer than 10 years ago, sadly. Um, we upped sticks. I was teaching at the Bartlett at the time. And uh, we moved for a rural life in a rather naive fashion. And I don't have any relationship with Wales. And we moved down to help somebody set up a business. <coughs> and over the years, as I've been driving around um, working on projects or advising businesses or arts organisations across Wales, um, I've been taken by the, the notion, the romantic notion of how the vernacular is, um, is perceived and celebrated. And this tends to be the starting point for everybody's understanding of a Welsh rural uh, vernacular typology, this uh, very humble abode, which is romanticised and now becomes the type of place that you can spend good money staying in for a holiday when the weather is fine, which is usually April, May. But um, on my drives, I observe and document a lot of different buildings of different scales, of different forms, invariably rural settings, invariably rural farmsteads, which have a very accidental um, sort of collaged effect of development that's very unplanned. And it's to be celebrated because I really enjoy the fact that there is an, an unconscious language of development which leads to um, unusual and, and also um, totally uh, unpredictable outcomes. This isn't my slide, this is a friend's slide, but this is again another um, example of uh, this assemblage arriving at very functional requirements in terms of storage or machinery or equipment, but actually in itself is a very um, potent, potent um, architectural form. And of course, there's the crinkly tin, and the, it's everywhere. And it's, uh, it's an architecture pour vera. It's a very cheap, efficient means by which people threw buildings up in very short periods of time. And of course, there's no surprise that the whole of Australia, and particularly New South Wales, is littered with this material. And that's obviously led to the work of people like Glenn Merkert responding to this very early pioneer form of architecture. So when we look at the vernacular, we could maybe say it's not thoroughly and academically planned or designed as the best way of maybe um, separating it from any form of intent. And to reinforce that, this is um, a settlement on the Black Hill, um, up in the Black Mountains near, near, near Brecon, which I went to visit a while back. And this is the south-facing facade of, of a building there are no windows bar the tiny little um, punched hole for the, for, the, for the pantry. But actually what it's creating is a fold yard. It's creating a form of shelter from the southwest prevailing wet weather. This is not a way that you or I would design as architects. This is a purely a functional set of requirements, but in itself is absolutely beautiful. This is a bowls club down in a place called Kidwelly, which is down on the fringe coast, which fed all of the smelting and ironworks and coal mines. And again, this is about a, a community providing recreation for their workers and using the skills and materials that were available to them at the time. And they're more celebrated. This is in a place called Reed Lewis, uh, a pair of Dutch barns which have been romantically restored and retained and almost turned into a film set of heritage items. This is sort of sitting next door to a guy called Greg Stevenson, who's a Welsh sort of TV critic and um, owner of an organization called Under the Thatch, which rents holiday cottages to people. 
So again, we could look at it as an architecture concerned with the domestic and functional. I put in agricultural because actually that's the way I see it. You could say industrial, but actually it's the, it's the, it's the bread and butter of Wales rather than public or monumental. I was having a long conversation on the phone with a journalist about another project we're doing up in Bangor this morning about the civic nature of architecture in Wales and the iconic nature. And I was just saying, actually, there's no need for urban iconography in Wales. We are a rural nation. We need to instead be looking at regional responses, regional responses that reflect the needs of the communities. Therefore, the many small attempts at um, development rather than these signature pieces like the Welsh Millennium Centre, for example. But also the vernacular needs to now start thinking about the response to change. And this is the transition from that um, sort of fork or field to fork mentality that farming would have been 200 years ago to a semi-industrialised system which involves logistics, it involves economies of scale. And that starts to transform the landscape in which we live and work. But also our eating habits, our uh, food chain habits in terms of how things arrive to us, how things are processed, how things are produced. This is actually just large-scale chicken farming. There's no hiding behind it. You probably want to close your eyes to it, but actually it's the reality of what we eat if you are a meat eater. And this is the trend at the moment for very large-scale dairy farming. It's going to be interesting to see what's happened this summer but with the drought, the fact that all of the winter feed has been used up over the summer because the grass wasn't growing and how these large-scale operations are going to impact on our relationship with the landscape in the future. But if we cast our mind back 150 years ago to the way in which large-scale infrastructure and industry and mining started to define the nature of settlement and habitat, these are obviously valley settlements. These photographs, by the way, are by James Morris, really fantastic uh, architectural photographer based in Wales. Currently, um, Arts Council um, on an Arts Council scholarship to sort of develop his practice. And these settlements, however dur they, they look, were actually a direct response to both the materials that were available in that region, but also the unbelievable influx of populations that arrived very, very quickly to service the needs of industry and scarring the landscape and taking away from this natural landscape to feed both the resources of the world, because a lot of this stuff was exported, as well as to actually build the houses that the workers needed. And no better is that defined than Blaina Festiniog up in the north. The whole of the landscape around the town is covered in slate. 85% of what came out of the mountain was discarded as not being good enough quality. We would now use 100% of it through different processes from road, um, road build-ups all the way through to dressed stone. But at, back in the day, you only got paid, having worked all day in the dark, to bring it to the, to the ground level, to split the slate, to see whether it was good enough quality to sell. A staggering, sort of, effectively a piece of architecture. And this isn't far away in Penagroyes, where we're just starting a new arts project um, in the town, heavily deprived now, but actually a really interesting um, demonstration of how one material served umpteen different purposes. So if you look at the diagram, I'll not ignore this side of the room, if you look at the diagram, you've got a rustication on the, on the stonework, you've got a beautiful decorative diamond pattern on the roof, you've got structural members holding up the building, as well as then a rustication and pattern making of the facade. It's an absolutely staggering building. It's, it's the gatehouse to what was an estate, which is now a, an emerging vineyard, believe it or not. So if we summarise it as a, maybe a category of architecture based on local needs and construction materials and reflecting local traditions, that bit is easy to understand. But also, it's evolving. It's changing over time. And it's starting to respond to a shift in need a shift in culture and personal uh, behavioural habit, habits, logistics, transport movements, whatever you want to look at. This is Merthyr. What was a traditional terrace now starting to appropriate all of the relevant 21st century 
add-ons, whether it be UPVC and aluminium or UPVC windows, concrete tiles, technologies, cars. It all starts to shift an understanding of what it is to represent the vernacular. As much as if you look at the suburbs and you start to identify what was late Victorian development for workers, which have then suddenly morphed into these sort of houses on steroids, which many of you will be familiar with, many of you may have grown up in these houses, never designed this way, but growing to service the constant demands of the human, the constant demands of the family and society. But also that sort of strange liminal space, that hinterland between settlements and industry, which you see time and time again across the coastline, especially on the south coast, where industry is further away than the town, and therefore humans start to appropriate this space and start to build their own form of architecture. <coughs> All again, totally accidental. And then the more obvious question, and something that is a little bit of a bugbear for me, not the prob I haven't, don't have any problem with um, renewables and the need to find alternative means of generating electricity, but it's actually the planned and unplanned development that's been allowed to happen over rural landscapes for the last 20 years. We have a game in the car driving up to meetings trying to see how many of these are not working, how many of them have failed, how many of them are actually um, a legacy to companies that have currently gone bust since they were installed. And then there are other factors. This is tourism, which is a coastal blight, which really came out of a post-war opportunity for people with less money to arrive at the seaside and stay in a tin can for a week. And this starts to form again another form of vernacular that is evident all the way around the fringes of Wales and obviously tracks down to the Western Supermare and the whole coastline that, 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 that bridges this city. But also that other historic desire to keep alive the history that was there. This is Powys Castle and there are incredible hedges. But there is a sort of um, a rarefication that comes out of uh, the, um, the restoration and preservation of these, the, these assets. It's an interesting book by Simon Jenkins which talks about the lost houses of Wales. Incredible number built and lost within a, within a 40 year period. But also if you look at the chapel movement, there are over 7,000 chapels in Wales. In the mid-19th century, there were nearly 3,000. That would have equ equated to a number of, the number of pews that would have put three quarters of the population in chapels at any one time. Staggering movement, absolutely staggering. But now, the chapel movement is almost extinct. It's dying out. You can buy a chapel for 100 grand, huge behemoth in some town or village anywhere in Wales. So when we return to the notion of this sort of romantic idea that the vernacular is just a tiny little cottage or a buffin stuck on a hill, I, I would question that, the validity of that. I would question actually how broad do we look at this unplanned, essential type of development. Again, that's what I put up before. But it... So the question is, where does this sit? These are screen grabs from local estate agents from around where I live. These could be in Ireland, this could be in Scotland, this could be in many suburbs in the UK. Does this represent a vernacular? Because actually it's representing local needs. And actually now, after three or four generations, these are traditions. These are what builders can build for you. This is what they're used to working with. But actually, maybe it's more a reflection on universality. It's a reflection on economies of scale, supply chain economics, all the normal things that go to globalise a country. And when I first arrived in Wales, I was looking at these with a sense of abhorrence. Now I'm kind of more inquisitive, trying to understand whether the, our architecture needs to start reflecting people's desires. <coughs> Somebody who's started working with us more recently, who was a builder for 30 years and now is sort of helping us with our technical output, talks about growing up in Carmarthenshire and his friends seeing reaching 40 and having a bungalow as this real sense of achievement. And there's nothing to knock about that, but it's about understanding your community and understanding people's values and desires. 
And of course, what's happening is this is, this is, this is the next step. This is this sort of um, morphing, this steroid development on smaller and smaller plots with larger houses where people are needing more space or thinking they need more space as living standards increase. But actually, there's a sense of loss of built environment, you know, the, the, the actual space around the buildings as well as the amenity that's provided for each house alone. So if you have an hour, idle hour or two, there's a great website called Mansion Hell, which is something similar in America but on a much larger scale, which starts to look at this rather strange mashup of architectural styles which bear no resemblance to the region at all, but also represent the way in which we can pick and mix what we want from anywhere in the world. And of course, the easy one to kick are the mass volume house builders. Two of these projects are in Wales, two aren't. And it's irrelevant which ones are and which ones aren't because there is no context and there is no need for context. Actually, what you're looking at is genericization, but you're also looking at a market which is providing to the masses choice. This is the limitation on choice. So Taylor and Green were working sort of in between the years, in between the war years, and uh, there were a couple, um, and Herbert Taylor was writing at the same time, and his book, Landscape and Rural Housing, really summed up what the last slide is talking about. So this is not a new phenomenon. This is something that's been going on really for the majority of the 20th century. It's exactly the same wherever you are. And maybe this is the cause of it. This was an exhibition at um, the National Museum in Cardiff, which was celebrating all of the different brickworks that were available around one region within Wales. And when I've been developing my own farm, I've been digging out many different bricks, which turned out to be a six mile radius around my farm, where there were nearly every village had a brickwork at a given point in time. But this is now how we would select bricks, an online selector which just gives us pure opportunity just to pick our way through and fit to whatever the project whim is at that time. This is globalization. This is supply chain economics. So somebody in the office yesterday just phoned Taylor Maxwell, one of the large suppliers, to find a brick anywhere from Europe or the UK that would satisfy the visual requirements of one project because there aren't any local brick makers anymore. That's the nature of how it's been consolidated. So before we get all sniffy about it, this is another game that happens in the office, which is Dezine. And this is um, trying to guess where the building is in the world without looking at the text. They're all black clad. Some of them are charred, some of them are not. And you struggle to understand that this is in Chile. That's in Norfolk. That's in Scotland. That's in Germany. And so on and so forth. So we as architects are also responsible for this genericization, this loss of context this desire for the new, but also, more importantly, this slightly clickbait culture where we lose our sense of place through our online habits. We're all, we're all guilty of it. Uh, every architectural practice the same. So it's important to put it into context in relation to what's on the ground in terms of major house building and other development. And this universality isn't anything new. It just happened in the old days. It was a very much a distinct type of process, obviously Corb outside Paris, or Mies with Farnsworth, or the case study houses of LA, or even the coastline of Wales. This is a project by Stevenson Studio. Lovely guy, John, but what he's building here is effectively that notion of coastal living on the clean peninsula. And this is where I have a problem because new books that are coming out that talk about this contemporary vernacular almost become an oxymoron. The vernacular is something that is unplanned. Regionalism is something that is conscious. And Vincent Canizzaro, writing in his book, talks about the voluntary process rather than uh, the response to local needs out of necessity. And it's a really important distinction as designers that we understand the difference. 
So I've put these in for you today. This book is great, and it's really worth reading. And he's pretty much, I think it's a PhD that's been converted into a publication. But what it does is it pulls together the main, um, the main uh, essays that have been written over the last 150 years on this exact subject. Some are human geography, others are sociology. But this, this is a, 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 great, a great source for, for an understanding of the subject matter. But there are others too. There's obviously McKay Lyon's book, Local Architecture, and the first to really address what's called critical regionalism, Lefebvre and Tsonis, Architecture and Identity in a Globalized World. But of course, this is all probably better known through Kenneth Frampton, who wrote uh, an essay called Towards a Critical Regionalism in the 80s, and it was a protest against the postmodern movement that was happening in the States. And he was aghast at this type of playmaking that was happening within the architectural community. And he fell out with the American um, team that were putting together the, the show at the Venice Biennale. I think it was the first architectural biennale at the time. And he went away and wrote this essay, um, arguing for a different form of modernism, arguing for a way in which you really had to address your regional context in a much more sophisticated manner. And when we spoke to Frampton about this, because we were going to put a bid together for the Biennale a couple of years ago to celebrate this essay, um, he was very clear that this was unfinished business. It was almost like an unfinished document. And again, that disappears in, um, in, in this book as one of the essays. So really worth reading. Anyway, what does regionalism look like Let's take the critical word out of that because it becomes a little bit divisive. It almost, the, it almost intellectualizes something that is possibly much more responsive. This is a Fernando Tavara in Porto building a, a tennis club. Now, Tavara and Cesar were part of the Porto school and were subversively developing architectural responses to what was at the time a, a fascist junta who were looking for a sense of national romanticism. And they were subverting this process through their own architectural output. This is the famous tea house that Caesar built on the coast, which was for the people. This was for everybody to enjoy. And when my student group from, the, uh, from Cardiff went a few years ago, it was a heavy day of rain, and it's now been turned into a shishi restaurant after a major restoration. So there's the irony of capitalism. And a plastic sheet was laid down on the carpet so they wouldn't muddy the floor. But at the time, this was Caesar really responding to the needs of the people with a palette of materials that were the only things available in a very poor country. It's a stunning piece of architecture. Actually, being pushed to make something very special through a limitation of palette. This is Alberto Ponis in Sardinia. If you don't know his work, there's a book called The Inhabited Pathway. He left London, having worked in London as a devout modernist, only to return home to understand that if he wanted to build, he needed a donkey to get the materials to site in this rugged coastal landscape. And out of it emerged this incredible architecture. You can go and stay in some of these houses. Or, of course, Jorn Knudsen, after the um, debacle of the Sydney Opera House, finding solace in Mallorca, building buildings, uh, of local stone to such a sophisticated level in terms of their spatial planning, their understanding of context, weather, solar and lunar cycles, and a huge reference for, if you don't know them, Teda, which are the current darlings of the Mallorca architectural scene, really great architects. I saw them in lecture in London last week. This is a, a great piece of architecture. And then Rudolf Olgiati, father of Valerio, the more famous sort of rock star architect, he was working sort of post-war in Switzerland and building this wonderful kind of DNA or this, this set of principles by which to design within his vernacular setting. <coughs> or a Pino Pizzagoni working in the Lombardy region of Italy, <coughs> subverting the vernacular, playing with the language of what he had around him, producing some quite extraordinary buildings. 
And in some ways, historically, when you start to track back and you look at what's been produced here, there are actually similarities with the metabolists in Japan. And there are similarities with what Valerio Orgiati is now producing in terms of his structural language. Or someone like Jan de Vilde. And of course there's Alto. I don't know whether Jeffrey Baker appears on the reading list, but there's a lovely analysis of this building in that uh, book, Building Strategies. Very, very clever way of, uh, as, as a young architect or a student, starting to understand what leads to what is often unconscious design decisions by a great architect. But Alto was a, was a you know, he, he was a magpie. He, he stole from many different cultures. There's Japanese, there's, Medi, uh, there's Mediterranean reference. There's a number of different things that came together in his architecture. And of course, then the state appropriates that as a form of nationalism. It's really fascinating how it almost goes full circle. And then, of course, Mercat. Who, again, has written uh, a number of times about his total dislike of postmodernism, his total dislike of, of high-tech, of all of these movements, when in fact, actually, he's been working really on his own, just plugging away, understanding his palette, understanding his context. And then more recently, what's become evident is Fujimori's work. This rather strange period in Japan's history, post-war, where they've shed everything to do with tradition, shed everything to do with uh, the historic context. And there he is working away in this kind of rather strange folk art manner, looking for a different form of architectural expression, which is partly referential to traditions, partly contemporary. This is my photograph actually standing with my client in Japan in May. And she's there just wondering what on earth this is all about because she is of a generation that has no contextual understanding of a pre-war world. And if you are interested in that, there's a, two great books by a, an author called Alex Kerr. One's called Lost Japan, which explains from a Westerner's point of view the understanding of how Japan has shed its past in pursuit of modernity. Whereas Fujimori, this rather eccentric professor in Japan, is producing this really rich body of work. And they are absolutely stunning when you get, get up close to them, the, the, the crafted nature of them. And then closer to home, we've obviously got our own sort of uh, poster boys, Peter Aldington, uh, working for many years in the 60s and 70s, producing a really rich body of subtle work. Turn End, his, ho his own home, is still open to the public. It's now a charity and trust. You can visit yourself. And then this is, um, this is a project actually in North Wales. It's not limited to Wales. I always forget his name. It's Bill Davis. And um, Jonathan Vining, the architect in Cardiff, has been doing a lot of documenting of the post-war output of Welsh architects to ensure that they don't disappear. And a lot of them was built actually through, for, through religious needs, either through the Catholic Church or through crematoriums. But this is up near Rill. And then similarly, over in Ireland, this is the work of, um, of I can never remember his name, it's Dennis, um, Dennis Anderson, who is producing an amazing set of settlements, responding to the vernacular, but also just working with the palette that he had amongst him. And he called this uh, an, a kind of a different intuitive type of architecture where he was feeling his way, designing the forms before actually resolving the plans. There's no private space. They're all public spaces between this building because he was looking to find a language that reflected the settlements of the fishing villages around him. Beautiful sketch. And then back to Taylor and Green in, in Loddon in Norfolk, producing a rich palette of work, almost like a garden city within one small space. Celebrated, I think, by John Piper. So Herbert Taylor went on to say, some people asked me if I made special studies of the local styles here in Norfolk. Well, I didn't. I kept my eyes open. And I suppose I just soaked them up. And I think in any creative practice, there comes a point where the intellectualization or theorizing of an idea just needs to be put aside. You actually need to understand emotionally what it is you're working with. 
And Herbert Taylor really sums it up there by just, he just soaks it up. It's an unconscious process by which you then regurgitate the architecture you create. So what about a current scene? Well, this is, this is Charles Knight's paintings of Ditchling, which were used as a precedent for Adam Richards' architects when he redeveloped the Ditchling Museum. It's a really great piece of architecture, working at a lovely scale within a relatively modest rural setting, understanding how to get both the balance of curatorial, curatorial ambition as well as architectural scale. Well worth a visit if you're down that way. And then Denison Works, working in the Isle of Tiri, where actually they have a family home, producing a kind of an assemblage of buildings as one house, piecing together these elements to understand what scale does to the context of the island. It's a very clever building. And of course, what it's doing is it's both reflecting what's around it in terms of its other buildings, but it's also dramatically changing with the amazing light that you're getting in the Northern Islands. And then probably one that wouldn't normally appear in this type of lecture, but Michael Hopkins' work up at David Mellor's factory in Haversage near Sheffield. I think this is, this is one of my favourite buildings, actually. It's really, really simple. It's a balance between addressing the needs of the local vernacular, but at the same time playing with the machine aesthetic of what has been produced within. They're making cutlery. That's what they do. And there's a whole language to the machinery, to the process of making, but also to the architecture of the building. It's a very fine piece of work. And then finally, down in Dungeness, highly celebrated through Derek Jarman's cottage, but also known for its nuclear power station and its, and its various military installations. It is technically a desert, and it's been really the last 20 years one planning officer having a level of control and understanding about how to allow development within this unplanned uh, coastline, which has arrived at a number of really extraordinary buildings. I think the inclusion of the caravan is so important, the idea that actually the built environment does not need to be seen as this contained bricks and mortar model. In fact, Simon Condor went on to build another one which is less successful, but actually contained the train carriage that existed on the site and had been the house before the new house was built. And then Nord's contribution to the living architecture portfolio. So perhaps the movement against universality, universality a self-conscious response to the vernacular. So in Wales, this is Coy Darcy, which is near Neath, along the M4. And this is the work of Ben Pentreath as part of the Dutchies' intervention within the, um, the, the ribbon development coming out of Swansea on the commuter belt from Cardiff. And this is a, this is a troubling project for me because on one hand it tugs at my middle class desires for something comfortable and uh, recognisable, but at the same time, it threatens me with its planned, unplanned proposal. On one hand, it looks very traditional, as if it's been established for 150 years, until we start to look at all of the modern garbage of life. There is no logical planning diagram within Alan Baxter's original master plan. So when you drive here, you can't actually get down the streets because of parked cars randomly thrown around. It's a little bit like going to a medieval hill town in Italy where the car has so totally dominated the, the narrow streets. But of course, it is the kind of the child of this, which is Poundbury, this coming together of any architectural style available. It's a fetish. And it's not necessarily a pleasant experience either. It's um, Graham Bisley from Pruitt Bisley, who's a very, very good architect in Somerset, 
writes on his journal about the original master plan by Leon Creer for, for this project and how successful it could have been, but for the political failure of Dorchester as a town not to see Poundbury as an independent service centre, but as a suburb of Dorchester. Whereas the duchy and the architects involved saw this as a service centre. So you end up with the equivalent of a town hall becoming a carpet showroom. And you end up with an awful lot of high-end residential because actually there are no civic functions provided within the space. So the second phase ends up looking more like an American college. It's a very, very strange landscape. But this is, in argument, responding to a sense of nationalism and national romanticism, which is combined with a sort of a regional response. But we're not alone. This is Jakarborg in Sweden, a beautiful medieval settlement with its cobbled streets fooling you into thinking it's three, four hundred years old, whereas in fact, seen from above, it's like the Truman Show. It's just a tiny block of housing funded by a, an industrialist from the area with, ha with farmland on one side and industrial units on the other and then heavy infrastructure d down here. So this isn't a new phenomenon. It's been going on for years. So when we return to Coy Darcy, we have to look at this critically and understand where its value sits. And the value sits in the sense of trying to create some form of Welsh identity using this form of architectural language. But actually, if you go here, this is the only bit of value. The rest becomes further and further reduced by the needs of the housing developers to meet their profit targets. And the quality starts to do be detracted. But this, again, it isn't something new to Wales. This is Edward uh, Haycock's scheme for Aberaeron in the 19th century around a very humble fishing port, which totally changed the fortunes of the town and allowed, to, allowed this town to be seen as a very different type of destination for holidaymakers. But Coit Darcy, and the reason I show that in relation to that is this is the planning guidance. This is the planning guidance that was issued by Swansea to determine the development, giving you all of the clues for how you had to break down the plan to create desire lines, to create features, to create a sort of asymmetry. This has 15 photographs of Poundbury in it, this document. Anyway, closer to home, the planning system also makes a struggle with a, in a local level. This is a, a village called Kilgeron in North Pembrokeshire. Fairly traditional, it's gone through all the normal changes in 20th century requirements. And this is what they're developing next door. Right opposite the street I've just shown you. Has no reference to scale, pattern language, nothing. So when you actually start to look at the documentation that we're having to work with as a as, a, as an architectural community, this is permitted development rights where they are using a particular type of language to allow people to see what is seen as normal. I'm just fascinated by the number of different windows you get in, in each drawing. But of course what it does is it leads to this. It leads to, again, we're still in Kilgaren, we haven't left the village. And we end up with really ill-considered architectural proposals by non-architects, but actually producing based on the requirements that the planners are working to. So anyway, it's all very well me slagging everybody else off, but we've actually got to talk about what we do. We're based in Carmarthen. We were based for many, many years at my farm, which has been a painful work in progress for the last decade. But we're working across the UK, and we now have a couple of projects abroad. And we started by saying no one's going to employ us because actually the value system isn't here to encourage architecture, so we have to start building ourselves. So we started with this little barn here, and then we got commissioned to develop a showroom for a couple who sell wood-burning stoves, and they had a bit of woodland, Douglas fir woodland, and we discussed with them about making a building that was purely about wood, both in terms of its structure, its cladding, 
and its fuel. And little did we know by the time we finished the building that it would also be about its smell. It's a beautiful building that's constantly giving back in terms of the environment that we've created inside. But in many ways, this is a regionalist response. This is actually choosing the language in which we're communicating the benefits and assets of the region, even if the architecture has no relationship to that which it surrounds. This is Chris, a very experienced furniture maker, building the frame, which we felled, selected the trees, felled, produced a cutting schedule, sent off to be uh, kiln dried before arriving on site, and then built a tent in which to build this building over a year. A very successful process, but incredibly time consuming, and only down to the brilliance of the contractor did this did this complete itself in the way that it did. And I only went back actually two months ago, I haven't seen these people for six years, and going back and them just explaining how happy they were in their building, even if they had filled it with IKEA furniture, I, I, I managed to get this shot before they, um, before they started putting their vases and sofas in. Anyway, this gave us confidence to build our own, and this is our first house that we built on the farm for £80,000, we didn't have a lot of money. We wanted something that we could just work with somebody and help us build. And the only extravagance are these silly things here, which is Parallel, which I would strongly recommend nobody uses. It's a Canadian lumber product, not dissimilar to strand board, but unfortunately, um, it doesn't like the Welsh environment and expands and contracts at a horrifying rate. But we built something where the floor was power floated by people who do cow parlours, for all the farmers locally. We bought gallery board that didn't need to be dry lined. We could fit ourselves. This is a four foot by two foot module. We bought tile stoves which would heat the space without the need for a main heating environment. And everything is, is really just from the builder's merchant, relatively simple installation. And we used the furniture that we had to assemble and then reassemble depending on the season. But this building is also designed to be, it started life as an office, it's now a home, it will become something else when we finally move out. But again, it's really just about understanding how things can be both temporary and permanent through the way in which you apply fixings and surface mount and then use furniture to balance the composition of space. This is a wall that we built just to subdivide bedrooms from children. Anyway, this gave us confidence. We thought, we can build, we can actually do things. We thought, well, what happens if we try and develop a building that other people could have? My wife's a painter, all her friends are ceramicists and makers. They're all desperate for studio space because they're fed up working in a damp barn. So we thought if we made a studio, maybe we could build something that was easy for anybody to make. So we built my wife a studio in the garden, made purely of CNC cut plywood, looking at what Alistair had been doing for WikiHouse, finding fault with the structural tectonics of that and looking at ways of rationalizing it so that the structure was also the finished wall panel, was also the span for the floor, the walls, the, la the lot and then filling it purely with material that could be fully recycled in wood fibre. And we built this for £15,000, and we thought, well, actually, that's pretty good, but the amount of labour and time that we put to this project just made it totally um, inaffordable for the market. So we carried on with a different prototype, making it ourselves again in the barn, using a local boat builder who had the CNC cutting platform, and this is for a graphic designer in a nearby valley where he built it all by himself, finding ingenious ways using our drainage crates to actually help him to get panels into place when he was only working on his own. Building over one winter and then having the choice to clad it in the material that he wanted to create a really, really thermally efficient building. He has no heating in this space. The only heating he has is from the screen of his Mac. That's all the heat and his own body heat. And this we built for £10,000. So eventually we're slowly getting there. We think we might have a product that may be available to the market. But what we were doing is testing both materials 
training the staff in the office, but also looking for an alternative, constantly looking for an alternative to what's available within the market. And this love affair with Corrugate carries on. This is a very small project in, near Elam Valley, which I don't know whether you know, it's in Mid Wales, just an extension to an original Buthin, trying to pull apart the old from the new, trying to preserve the character of the original. This is just finishing at the moment, creating a new entrance into what would have been the traditional cottage to provide a bathroom, running water, all of the things that didn't exist for the last 150 years. And this whole valley in Comistwith is littered with these tiny buffins, all still preserved from the tin mine that's nearby. And then 10 miles down the road, another family just needing additional space, trying to reorganize a rather strange space between an extension to a rather beautiful farmhouse and then a barn that's got residential status where you'd normally walk through to the back door and in, or round to the front door and in, rescheduling the sort of the accommodation to build hierarchy, but also provide a shared biomass facility in the middle. And we did this by just one intervention, three tiny little roofs sitting on a white plinth, creating a formal entrance to the main front door, you can just see the disc there for blowing in the, the pellets for the wood boiler. But also creating a sheltered space for chopping of wood and measuring of fruit that they'd grown. And as, as always happens on Grand Designs, a child arrives halfway through the build, so now being the place for a swing for their little one. But again, looking at the least we could do with the most impact, but at the same time, Understanding, this is one of three colours that we could source locally that was seen to be used on all the barns. Again, trying to sort of sit within the context within which we work. And again, another project, this time in uh, North Pembrokeshire, overlooking Fishguard Bay. This is the artist Mike Perry. He's currently exhibiting, exhibiting in Aberystwyth. Works all over the UK, a former kind of Greenpeace activist, uh, documenting the waste that comes from the sea, converting it to art, and working from what is now his new home and studio, a conversion of an old barn, which we've extended to create a gallery and studio space to the right here. But at the same time, just working with the local craftsmen, trying to preserve as much as we could, making any intervention as subtle as we can. This is almost like a subterranean house. Again, just finishing. And I suppose this project, this is back in Aberaeron with the, with the Haycock scheme. This project probably sums up um, the way we think as a practice, the idea of assembling buildings from rural typologies, gathering them together so that there is a familiarity to their context, but at the same time, there is a scale that is manageable for, uh, for the viewer to understand this as not one large house, but actually a coming together of rooms and functions. It sits bizarrely on the edge of the town. This is all of the Haycock scheme at the, around the harbour. The rest of this space would have all been rural landscape up until 40 years ago. And over time, what happened was all of these seaside pavilions were built, and our plot is just here. It's a house on three sides, forming a courtyard, which is protected from the main road, which builds around two sides. On a steep slope, you can just see that there in terms of how it staggers down the hill, creating a garden landscape that gives both different scales of space, be it orchard, potager, or courtyard. Providing sheltered space within somewhere to sit and eat, but actually again being totally screened from the road. And then internally, all of these forms coming together, actually giving us a very unusual roof line, which allows for 
a sense of different space as you're moving through the house from these larger scale open plan areas to the more intimate spaces such as the bedroom and the study at the high level. So this is John the builder. He, um, he likes to employ people to watch him work. And it's been fraught with problems, this project, actually. It's taken forever to build. But the qualities there and the craftsmanship of what we're trying to achieve, this is a reference, really, to the slate herringbone walls that sit around the countryside in this area. And then also looking at almost sort of stitching together the relationship between materials from a beaded sweet chestnut cladding onto a rail that's joining the, the brickwork. There's a courtyard in the centre. It's just starting to strike its scaffold. More herringbone brickwork forming this plinth around the base. And a coming together of these forms, a coming together of different scales <coughs> to respond to the needs of the internal spaces. And we didn't realise until this was built that this ended up looking like sort of a, a twin exhaust on a car. Totally unintentional, but actually trying to just locate all the rainwater goods that took all <coughs> of the courtyard into one place rather than having more than one position. So it's not all serious work. Sometimes it's just folly, and this was a project that we did last summer with Channel 4 um, for this project, Cabins in the Wild. Some of you may have caught it. You may have been some of the very few people that did actually watch it. It was one of those projects where, for the Year of Legends, which was a Welsh tourism um, initiative, they asked us to, well, we bid for it, but we, and we won one of the places, but we were asked to respond to... Um, this notion of legend, whether it be a dragon or some form of industry, and we've always been fascinated by the hat, and it's a story about Jemima Nichols, who was uh, a wife of a, a local farmer in Fishguard, <coughs> and there's a story of the, 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 the French invading England and being blown off course and arriving in Fishguard, only to get drunk on the proceeds of a Portuguese frigate that had, that had shipwrecked nearby, and then suddenly there were all of these women coming from the villages to the coastline to see what was going on. And they mistook them as infantry. And they saw them off. And what happened over the 19th century was this became a form of cultural appropriation, an identity, a national identity, a national dress that was going to be used to symbolise Wales. And now every poor child has to dress up like this on St David's Day, uh, my kids included. And it gets used on postcards and tourism offerings. And then sometimes gets subverted. <coughs> and we like the idea of this um, icon. But we also like the idea that Wales is so rich in culture, whether it be song, poetry. And they need this type of identity, which is clearly unnecessary, to form that national identity. So we inhabited the hat with a place to sleep, but also we understand what it's like to holiday in Wales, you need to be protected from the weather. So around the brim of the hat was a protected skin which would give you a sitting room, a bathroom, a place to cook, whilst at the same time being able to escape to your bedroom and then stargaze at night. And it was a sort of mashup of the history of weaving, the maritime spirit of knots, some bodging as we pulled the timber, and some sail technology. So structural engineers look away now because this was sort of breaking all the rules with this timber pole structure of a series of steel ring beams which were made by a man who I found in a local village who made hammer throwing cages for the athletics industry. And then the telly got involved and told us to put this at the base of a high mountain near the coast where the winds are incredibly strong. So this is Bryn who we worked with trying to assemble this on the windiest day of the year in early summer before the weather broke and it was absolutely beautiful. And it sits as this folly in the landscape where you connect with nature but at the same time you retract if the weather is poor but you're sleeping under the stars with a perfect view. <coughs> and then just some details of 
the bell that rings on the front door, the bucket uh, for the sink. Buckets for lights, in fact. I think they're everywhere. <coughs> for your toothbrush, for your LED lights. Just being playful with the theme. I'm going to run out of time here, aren't I? Shall I speed up? Yeah, I'm going <coughs> to skip this. This was a competition that we lost, so we don't need to know about that. And a project that we do currently got on site in Hereford, which is rather beautiful, for a tithe barn, which collapsed halfway through our survey. But we have a digital survey, so that's all right. And this will go on site next week, where we start by building a standalone services barn to allow the client to be on site while the rest of the development is built. Again, just using a really simple palette that we can control, that is readily available, that is affordable. So anyway, I'll finish on Caring Wood. This was obviously a collaboration with uh, James McDonald Wright, who uh, approached me in 2009 to work on this project as a means of um, building a home for his family, his extended family, had been commissioned by his father-in-law on a site in Kent. He'd spent two years looking for a site. And this really became the, the starting point. This is Great Dixter and the Oast Houses that would have been standalone objects, but have been slowly morphed into this other language of architecture. Set in 82 acres with views of the South Downs and Pilgrim's Way, with obviously views of other Oast houses sitting in the landscape. It was a diagram for four families to live together or to live apart. And this was the client's diagram for us, which of course we then said, yes, thank you very much, put it aside and went away to explore. Making over 50 models, trying to understand the nature of family, the nature of a village where you had communal spaces as well as private spaces. Making models to deal with scale these were in an exhibition in the summer in the Aram Gallery. And finally arriving at a scheme that gave each family an independent space, but also then a collective space in the center, which contained a gallery, a music hall, and then all of the main functions of family living. So there are no kitchens within these spaces, only in the main building, but there are bathrooms and bedrooms in each of the units. And this is part of a larger estate, where you have an estate cottage connected to the house, but also a whole working farm and acres and acres of planting which are currently being put into use for both fruit, soft fruit, and crops. This is the model we presented to the planners after almost two years of design development, showing the house sitting within a wooded glade, partly on the hill, partly off the hill, or as Frank Lovett Wright would say, you know, of the hill, bedded in, so at one scale you're looking at something that feels two stories, at the other it's four. And our very early CGI, which ends up sadly looking more like timber shingles due to the misunderstanding with our Polish friends who are making these for us. But us also cutting the interior to trying to explain to the client how he was going to exhibit his vast collection of artwork but also how this family would cohabit and eat together and join in the normal things that an extended family would wish to do. As a diagram, it's relatively straightforward. It's really just a square with a slight shift in the centre in a courtyard and then four separate living spaces, uh, uh, family spaces sitting in different corners of the plan. This on the main entrance level with a large stair that brings you down and a space for music, a space for art at the centre with strategic views into different garden spaces. But of course, our job when we got past planning was to split the workload. My office in Wales, which we grew to about six or seven of us to develop the technical aspects of that, then liaising with London, who were on site. Again, over 350 drawings produced for this project, but at the heart of it was a central model and the reason that the model was essential was partly to do with the geometry, but also to do with the coordination of the complex steelwork, the services, and all of the other elements. So by the time you've 
layered all of this up. This is not extraordinary for most orthogonal buildings, but when there is an awful lot of complex geometry, it can be a bit of a head wrecker. But it allows us to then communicate with the people who made the CLT, the cross-laminated timber, which was manufactured in Austria, and then still cutting models at this stage to communicate how that would work, how the panels would go together, before it all arrives in this great theatre of two weeks being assembled on site. And again, you're then in a position to be able to stand on the site with the client, understand the internal spaces that have been created before the building then gets mothballed again by a city of scaffold as everything gets clad. And while it's all getting clad, we're resolving all of these technical aspects of the build using vernacular materials, a huge number of tiles manufactured by hand to clad the whole of the building. The single largest, largest order for this um, tile manufacturer in, in South Sussex, which eventually closed because they had no more clay left. And us making prototypes, this is a one to two prototype using one to one materials because we were breaking all the rules of tile laying. So Vishwar, our architect on site, would be overseeing this and sending us then back technical responses to understand how we dealt with every flashing, every dressing of each detail so that we didn't lose the opportunity to make sure that this building was robust for at least 100 years with a limited amount of maintenance. It's almost got a roof and then another roof. And again, part of you know, over 40 sheets of details, just to help you understand that build-up is 700 millimetres. It's medieval in scale because it's built to passive house standard. Huge amount of natural material to build the thermal um, requirements. And an, a number of robust details for all of the thresholds, any ventilation penetration. And then the building stayed like this for nearly three years, enshrouded sometimes been opened up to work without scaffold brilliance at technology to allow you to fill and seal the building other times protected from the weather because of course all these materials are fairly fragile on the, while you're installing and then the layers that sit below the skin working on how to develop all of these tile, tile kicks with just simple plywood gussets and lightweight framework but the detail needed to work up close that you could touch as well as far away where you would never really be able to understand the standard of detailing. So from the sculpture on one hand and all of the services coordination to the finished article, <coughs> these lintels were all manufactured as precast concrete beams and then bedded with the slates and then lime pointed on site. So it really just taking a Voisey detail or a Lutyens detail and expressing it in a contemporary fashion. Again, just referencing the past whilst becoming its own regional identity. The diagram becoming evident from above. and the rooftop in the middle, which leads to a courtyard. Of course, the crane was in the courtyard for the majority of the build, and once struck, you end up with this James Terrell space in the middle, a place for the client to walk and contemplate. From the north, four storeys, five storeys, quite fortress-like, and then further up the hill, it diminishes in scale at sometimes looking like an agricultural barn, at other times looking like the formal entrance to a country estate. And slowly the landscape is coming back and what's so interesting is things like this. These are an artifice, this is all an artificial landscape that is put back after the concrete works are completed. But now if you went to site you would never know the difference between the two. So on one side <coughs> large, pencil-like, monolithic, on the other, quite intimate and embedded. And then the relationship which we tried to capture on the CGI, you see just the relationship with the estate cottage in the distance. Again, just tipping the nod 
to the way in which, from a distance, you see other roast houses within this valley. Rowan Moore described this as a conquer. He said it's of this hardened shell on the outside, but this very smooth interior. This was a client requirement for really a space for art, a space of total flexibility. But actually, if we'd done any more, I think it would have been too much, because in itself, the geometry is enough. I put this slide in on purpose because this is the duration of the project from when, they, when we were commissioned to the time that I lost control of my fine parenting. <laughs> but it's important for you to understand it's a long, long journey when you're building complex buildings. Architecture is not overnight and I think this is the other issue that the world of CGI is artificially creating hope with <coughs> clients as much as it is with completion for us as practitioners and it's a very dangerous game to play to think that there is some form of conclusion to the process. It's very, very much more involved than that. So anyway, this is where I am at the moment. I don't know whether this is going to work. Maybe not. I'll leave that. But we were building the frame over the summer, cladding it of my own house. And that is the old house that we demolished two years ago as a monument to the old making way for the new. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.